Okay, well, um, my name is Matt O'Malley and I will be moderating this uh, second panel here on cochlear implants. And uh, we will start to get our panelists together. Um, for this panel, we'll have Dr. Elizabeth Parkins, who I know you have uh, been listening to. Uh, we also have Dr. Mark Bennett, Dr. Kareem Taufik, uh, Dr. Renee Gifford, who gave the talk on um, cochlear implant indications, will be joining us at 2.45. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Alejandro Rivas will be joining us from Cleveland as well. So uh, it may take us just a second to get everybody ready here, uh, but when they are, we will start rolling with the slides and we will move the slides ahead to our first case uh, for this panel. Okay, so uh, case one here. Um, we're dealing with a 37 year old gentleman who had meningitis about two and a half years ago. He had with this uh, event acutely when he had the meningitis has had some vision and hearing loss. He has only uh, limited residual vision, meaning he can see you in the clinic room, he can read large print, but he does have some issues with his vision that cannot be corrected with uh, simply refraction. Uh, he uh, had very significant hearing loss with the acute event and has not recovered. He was off balance initially, but actually has recovered to the point where he tells you his balance is fine. I don't suspect he does uh, a lot of very active things, uh, but meaning that he can walk around appropriately and is independent in his activities. He has a normal exam by the time he sees you. Minimal right ear sound perception. You can see his audiogram uh, presented in the lower corner there. So he's got a little bit of sound awareness at very loud sounds for the right, and you can see his aided response is indicated as well. He gets 0% in both ears on any type of word testing. Uh, he is audiometrically uh, a candidate for a cochlear implant. Can we move to the next slide? Here's his imaging. I'm sorry, they're, they're single images, so you don't get all of the imaging you'd normally like to see for uh, surgical planning. But the point of it is uh, the CT doesn't look as bad as you thought it might maybe for two and a half years. You can still see what looks like some cochlear architecture. Uh, in the right ear, when we look at the T2 sequence on the MRI, the thin cut high resolution T2, you can see the right ear has a good fluid signal through the basal turn uh, of the cochlea and extending to the mid turn. Uh, in the right ear, you really can't see much uh, in the way of uh, fluid signal. There's maybe a tiny spot of fluid signal just at the bend coming off the basal turn heading to the mid turn. So pretty significant uh, ossification in the left ear. Uh, the right ear has, um, you know, it looks like I unfortunately have confused what I've written on the slide here with what we're showing uh, uh, on the, the images. The right ear has the fluid signal, the left ear has no fluid signal. It doesn't really matter. Assume that one has some signal and one does not. Let's move to the next slide. Let's do some questions, okay? So in the current situation, the current state we're in, uh, what is your current method for dealing with uh, labyrinthine ossification, electrode technique? How do you try to approach these cases? Let's start with you, Dr. Bennett. Um, I think the most important part is having a really um, upfront uh, talk with this uh, patient in, in clinic about realistic outcomes um, and discussing uh, which ear to implant, obviously, because both of them are going to have some challenges. Uh, if you implant the right ear with the um, with it, some of the fluid, um, that's potentially his only sound ear. Um, so if you don't get a good result with the implant, he, uh, you're obviously not left with much on the other side. I think I would try to encourage him to have his ossified side implanted first with some sort of styleted electrode, um, knowing that it may not be as good of an outcome, but at least that gives us our best outcome of continuing to use a hearing aid on the other side and potentially implanting uh, the bad or worse ear. Okay, so if I understand you saying you go after the worst ear, the most ossified ear, 
styleted implant, try to get that in there, kind of see how he does, let him keep that other ear, even though uh, he really doesn't get any ward recognition out of it for the time being. The idea of let's go with the worst ear first, uh, yeah, and worst, then maybe worst, we come back to the other ear. Is that yeah, worst in case summary scenario, kind of what you're saying? Yeah, worst case scenario, you're going after the other ear months out down the road, and it wouldn't change the outcomes at all. Okay, all right. Does anybody else have a different view on it? Anybody approach that differently? I think, you know, always think about timing of implantation after uh, case of meningitis, especially on children, that's something to consider. And oftentimes we want to try and implant them as, as quickly as possible. Um, the only head station I would have in waiting um, to implant the, that ear does that, that does have the pacification or the ear that does have the fluid is that that would be, then become a pacified and you lose that patency of the cochlea if you were to wait. Um, so I know all of this, a lot of this is about talking to the patient about expectations. So you could go in thinking, me, I'll try and implant both sides at the same time or just um, consider implanting the ear that has um, the patency of the cochlea that like was likely to be less ossified. All right, so let's say so, you go in there, you go after that most ossified side first, since uh, everyone here has gone with, we'll go for the most ossified side first. You drill into the basal turn, you don't really find a, a I would fluid go, filled loop in there. Is that, you, is that a consensus that we're going to, or is that a, a, the final decision? Oh, I, I'm glad you're speaking up, Dr. Rivas. I, I was hoping somebody might offer a differing opinion and we could all kind of we could have some different viewpoints on this. Would you Would you go differently on this case, Dr. Rivas? I will go to the less ossified cochlea. Okay. You know, it's, Tell us why, help has, us out. And what would you, what kind of electrode would you use in there? I think that you have a better chance of doing, well, first of all, it depends where I am. If I am at Vanderbilt and I have Dr. Labadee in my team and I can, he can give me a, um, a image guided track I will have that as an option. We've done that, we did that in the past when I was at Vanderbilt, where we had ossifications of the cochlea. Uh, Dr. Lavari would create a plan, um, a customized plan to know where the, the lumen would be and where to go. And that would give us an, um, a potential option. Now, that is particularly important if you are going to go uh, on the most ossified cochlea. I would go to the least ossified cochlea because even in even if when there is fluid in in the in the in the T two image, a lot of times that's still uh, filled with um, with ossification or fibrosis, and so I just feel that, that was, that's that's the better option. And regardless, patient has no discrimination. And if they don't have the most no discrimination one ear versus the other. Oh, might as well just go through the one that might have the better chance of putting it in. That's what I think. Now, the other, the other point is, the other point is, is um, when you go into that cochlea, uh, the, the most common problem is that you're going to find this chalk white material inside the lumen. And, and it's very difficult to, to determine where the, the modulus is. And the most common problems with with ossification of the cochlea is that you try to follow that, that chalk inflammatory or fibrotic tissue and do you end up getting into the modulus and damaging the spire ganglion cells. So that's where the image guided technology have a significant amount of benefit. All right. Well, well, why not, so we have why not try to implant both ears in the same setting? You were saying, know. Dr. Tofik, that maybe implanting both in the same setting is a reasonable approach as well. Yeah. I, Why do I you just, think so? Uh, well, I'm not sure that there's much to lose in this situation. I, I, I don't disagree with Dr. Rivas that trying trying to implant the, the right ear, the one with the fluid space first, is, is reasonable and makes sense because that's the ear where you're, you're likely to have the best chance of success. But I also think that it's not unreasonable to try to implant the opposite side in the same setting either. Uh, of would, course, that, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, not considering um, any discussion you may have with a patient about the risks and benefits of trying to implant the, the other side at the, at the same setting, too. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, we, we heard a lot about shared decision making when it comes to acoustic neuromas. I think this is probably a great case of shared decision making with the patient talking about 
you know, better outcomes on the side that has your only, you know, perception of sound, even though it's not um, good, good clarity um, versus implanting and having a, a less a desirable less. result in the opposite. Yeah, no, it's certainly a, a difficult case and chosen for that reason and chosen because I was hoping there'd be a good diversity of opinion. I mean, if you look at this, we've had one panelist say, I'd go for the worst year first. The other says, I go for the better first. And another said, I'd do both at the same time. And so it just kind of shows you, you can choose a, a path uh, anyway, though I would suspect, and I could be wrong, but I would suspect our other panelists who who chose to, to start with one year would, would hope to do the second year relatively shortly thereafter. I don't think there's anyone who's saying, let's just do one year uh, here. Um, in Dr. Rivas, you spoke about this idea. One of the hard parts we get to is a fully ossified or a fully ossified basal turn. And you drill in there and you get to this chalky stuff and you're trying to dodge the modialis because you're trying to preserve the neural structures there. And you try to drill out a passageway to put an electrode in. When you have done that in the past, how well do those folks seem to do for you? You're on mute. Not there, that well. Go. Yeah, not that well. Yeah. Uh, not that well. The, no, I mean the, the the reality of it is that uh, when you have ossification of the of the of the uh, SCA vestibuli and the SCA tympani, uh, you typically also have uh, damage of spire ganglion cells. There, it, there's very little neuron survival. Number one, uh, and that has that has been shown by NATO in the past. Uh, in some of the uh, of the histologic studies, so so the results are not great. More important is that we presented not too long ago. Uh, I think that it was can't, I can't remember who it was, but I think that probably was uh, Ashlyn C who presented a, uh, uh, did a presentation on, on several of our patients with um, who had ossification of the cochlea that have a, a very high rate of facial nerve stimulation. Um, and so you're trying to put uh, an electrode and then it just, it, uh, you, and, uh, first of all, they don't, it doesn't work that well. And then you have to increase, um, uh, the, uh, you have to increase the amount of current that you give to the, that electrode. And unfortunately, uh, that creates a lot of, of stimulation. And I, I wish I could say that it's only, uh, on the, on the areas closer to, um, in the areas closest to the, to, to, um, the second turn of the cochlea, but it's actually stimulation throughout. If you get to the second turn of the cochlea on this, I'd be really impressed. If you're lucky, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. The facial nerve stimulation. And that, that brings up the, one of the things I was trying to come to with this as well was the electrode choice. As, as you all know, for a period of time, people were advocating split electrodes. Uh, for this. Um, to my knowledge, the cochlear uh, group no longer provides the split electrodes. Uh, I think the Medel group will pr provide us with quite a, a wide variety of electrodes upon request. Um, and uh, does anyone use, you know, anything different electrode-wise like that anymore? Um, when I dealt with this gentleman, we, uh, we put in a uh, styleted cochlear brand electrode, the idea being when I pull the stylet out, use the stylet to try to give me some strength to it. When I pull the stylet out, hopefully it hugs closer to the modialis to help with the issues you were talking about with facial nerve stimulation. Does anybody use uh, anything different than that or have a different electrode choice for these kind of cases? Dr. Maui, just um, so we're all clear, which ear did you implant first? Oh, I, I did the I did them both at once. Uh, so all, both in one case, but I, I elected to go for the uh, the ear with the fluid signal first to try to make sure I could get a good electrode in. The complicating factor in this, and we know that this comes up not so much on panels, but in the real world, we see this gentleman had a situation where he had uh, good insurance coverage for a narrow window of time, and that coverage in the future was uncertain. And so this may have been his only chance to get a surgery uh, for this uh, condition. Uh, and in that case, you know, he and I discussed, you know, this would be a good chance. Let's try to do our best to get you hearing. He was also very concerned that if we waited additional time, that the uh, whichever cochlea we didn't do might become less implantable in the future, which it might, though we know that 
uh, this, this process doesn't usually move quite so fast. So I did both at the same time, but I started with the ear I felt I could implant best. That actually went stunningly well. I was very uh, surprised by how well that went. I tried the second side uh, and we really couldn't uh, succeed with even getting an implant in that ear. Despite how it looked on the CT, I thought I'd get somewhere. We really didn't get anywhere. Uh, and so we didn't place an electrode on the second side, which he was uh, prepared for that preoperatively. So uh, obviously ossification is a difficult problem. Uh, and I think we've covered most of the issues with this. Um, why don't we move to our second case now? I see Dr. Gifford uh, will be joining us here. She may be able to provide some input on these next two cases as they feature uh, Matt, some- Can I ask you, how did he division did audiologically? Pardon me? And how did the patient do audiologically? Uh, uh, you know, reasonably well. Uh, we don't have as much long-term data on him as you might like at this point, uh, but reasonably well. Though, you know, just as you pointed out, these folks with ossification, they do not do as well as you would think they do just based on the insertion characteristics. Uh, they tend to, you know, you're, you're lucky if you can get someone uh, to get, uh, you know, uh, you know, word scores above 30%. Uh, they usually get a lot better sound awareness, but they do usually seem to struggle a decent amount with their clarity. Uh, even in people I've done, I've done some bilaterals very close to the time of meningitis, uh, where we got on it very quickly. We were able to get good insertions on both sides and they just do worse than average has been my experience, similar to what we had presented in that paper. Uh, we'll skip that question here. So uh, here we have a middle-aged gentleman, progressively worsening hearing loss in both ears, using hearing aids, trying, you know, doing his best use for years, actually, but benefit is dimin diminishing. Problems in noise, identifies himself as an amateur musician, enjoys music, which uh, in this city is a very common uh, thing to come along with our cochlear implants. Uh, he tells me his daughter has hearing loss as well. And let's move to the next slide if we can. And this is the kind of uh, hearing loss he presents with. You know, you've got your relatively classic high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, uh, relatively poor word recognition scores. Uh, then we start the cochlear implant evaluation and you see in certain situations, particularly in quiet, he does really reasonably well. Uh, when we add noise into it, he struggles substantially more. Uh, and uh, the right ear does appear to do worse than the left uh, in this. And so based on this testing, we say, okay, he meets FDA criteria for an ES, EAS implant uh, uh, in the right ear only. Uh, and so you're in, in a bit of a tricky situation. This is our hard situation because he has some hearing there. He's got something to work with. Uh, Renee, you presented an interesting talk today about expanded indications how does this case kind of mesh in with what you presented us earlier? Is this a really a kind of a great cochlear implant candidate in a way? I think he's ideal. I mean, really, I, I look at these hearing losses all the time and this is the hearing, these are hearing losses are so difficult to manage from an acoustic standpoint with just amplification because we're talking about cochlear dead regions and the high frequencies and they need just moderate amounts of gain in the low frequencies. So they're just not happy with their hearing aids. Um, this is someone who I would recommend a cochlear implant for with absolutely no hesitation. Um, and actually, we might even want to think going forward, um, you know, he's still young. This is someone in his early 50s. It's extremely young to me these days. And um, you might want to think about going even bilateral at some point, you know, particularly with hearing preservation, you know, surgical techniques and, um, and, and the right electrode arrays. He's going to do great. Yeah, but now that would be for bilateral for him based on this presently, that would kind of be an off label thing, wouldn't it? Um, based on where you stand presently. Um, I mean, with respect to um, the audiometric configuration, yes, but not if you look at the speech and noise, he meets criteria for cochlear implant. He's 45% correct in that left ear. And bilaterally with hearing aids, his best score is 39%. So that actually meets standard conventional criteria. Oh, well, that's excellent then. So, the panel, the, the purpose of a panel obviously is a diversity of opinions. Uh, one of the things when I see a, a patient like this that that is hard is the risk of we're going in there and we, we want to save all that hearing, but we sometimes don't achieve that even with a good surgery. Uh, depending on the patient, 
sometimes these discussions can be different. Do any of the others uh, there, Drs. Brown, Rivas, Tofik, is this a patient you'd look at and be cautious about implanting, or are you as excited as Dr. Gifford about implanting him? <laughs> I would ask Renee what I should do. Well, she told you to implant, so you're, you're going, you're in. <laughs> I just have so much confidence in you guys. I'd say just put it in and preserve hearing. So, so what I do you think, think Dr. Rivas? So, no, I, I mean, I agree. If I think that that the sooner the better, to be very honest. I mean, we we saw this over and over uh, with uh, Renee and with Jordan when I was at Vanderbilt. We see that that the younger the younger the patients, the children, uh, the children have resilient cochlea. I mean, they have very good cochlear reserve to implant this 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 implant. So I know that this is an older well, not older, but older. Well, it, it, not not. <laughs> young, but but the, the sooner, the sooner the better um, uh, to try to preserve. I think that age, um, we we've shown in multiple of our of our papers that age is a, is an impact factor on trying to preserve hearing. I think that that's true, um, and so if you can implant these patients um, uh, uh, at a younger stage, they do phenomenal uh, with the implant. Um, and then when you put the, the EAS component, you get double DJ improvement on the thing. So, so, um, yeah, if you presented this case as a, as an, a child, as a child, uh, I'll be even more excited than Renee about implanting him. Okay. All right. Well then let's go to the electrode choice question. Who would like to tell us maybe Dr. Perkins, we haven't heard from you in a while. If you're going to implant this individual, what kind of electrode is, it's kind of, you, are you thinking, this is my first shot that I'm going to go with? What do you think? Yeah, so I think in, in general, I personally tend to favor a flexible electrode. Uh, at Venerable, I think we've had a great success with the cochlear um, 532 and 632, which is uh, a, a pre-curved electrode, but it does not have a stylet and just has an external sheath. Um, so it has the advantage of having uh, or being a pre-curved electrode and getting close contact from the dialysis um, without an a, stylet, a stylet, which can cause more cochlear trauma. Um, so people tend to think it's the best of both worlds. Um, you know, but I personally, I'm a big fan of just a, a flexible straight electrode. Um, then you come to the question about the length of the electrode. Has, you know, historically, a shorter length of the electrode uh, was introduced for hearing preservations uh, to reduce trauma to the apical portion of the cochlea, um, therefore reducing your trauma and, preser and, and preserving hearing. Uh, but now I think, you know, we've gotten so good at hearing preservation techniques um, that you, you can preserve hearing even with a longer electrode, uh, like a metal flex 28 or even a cochlear 522 five, or 622. Um, yeah. Okay, excellent. Anyone have a different electrode they'd like to, to stand up for and say, this is what I would like to do? I, for me, I, I, I like the uh, I like the 632 a lot. I like that the pre-curved electro that um, Liz was talking about. And, you know, to my knowledge, I think our, our, uh, the, our data suggests that there's not a huge difference in hearing preservation between a 632 and a 622 or a 532 and a 522. Um, but uh, I think from from a patient satisfaction and, and you and, you know, frequency of CI use standpoint, you know, from my conversations with our audiologists, that the patient one of the big benefits of having the pre-curved the perimedialar array is that is that uh, the battery usage is uh, much less of a problem for patients. The battery doesn't tend to drain nearly as quickly as it does with the five two two and the six two two. Okay. Hey Matt, can I ask a question to Alejandro? Alejandro, you were kind of um, in the forefront with the hybrid testing. Would you put a hybrid um, in the left ear when you went to implant that ear? I would not put a hybrid. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that the risks are, are too high of not getting the, the stimulation that you need. And if if that and the low frequency hearing drops either immediately or over time, the patient is not going to be is uh, the patient is not going to be happy about about. Um, um, is not going to be happy about the results that you're going to get, and likely you're going to have to exchange that electrode into uh, switch that electrode for a longer for a longer array. And so, again, if you probably um, 
Yeah, so so it, I think that from my perspective, it depends on what manufacturer the patient cho chooses to have. If the patient chooses to have a, a, a medel device, then 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 that that really is the question that, as as Liz mentioned, uh, and is it either am I going to put a twenty eight or am I going to put a twenty four? Uh, um, I wouldn't put a thirty one. <laughs> that's for sure. So I, on the on either of these years, I would use probably a twenty eight. Um, and the reason for that is because the, um, the five, uh, a thousand is not very good. If we have really high frequency hearing uh, up to a thousand uh, from, from 125 Hertz to 500 Hertz, um, uh, then I might consider 24, but before that, but if where it is, I would still use a 28. Now, if it is, um, if, if the patient chooses a cochlear, device, I go every single time with a 632. Um, I don't know, uh, we still have to wait what the results are with a 624. Uh, time will tell. They're, they're, they're about to start a clinical trial on 624 uh, and here in preservation. So we'll see what that shows. Um, and if it's uh, advanced bionics, uh, again, like Liz said, I would not offer this patient a uh, straight array, a um, stylated array, and therefore uh, my only other option with a AB would be um, a uh, a uh, slim um, J array. But yeah, no, no hybrid for me anymore. Okay, excellent. Let's move to the next slide. Let's kind of spice it up just for a bit. We kind of talked about this. We talked about the electrode. So let's go one more slide here. So, but this turns out to be his CT and it doesn't show up well, again, because we're looking at individual cuts and I, I didn't have this in a way we could scroll through it. But the point is you've got enlarged vestibular aqueducts, uh, both sides, and they're, they're not the biggest ones you've ever seen. It's not a competition. Uh, this, this doesn't win uh, x-ray of the month kind of a thing. But does this change anything for you when we're trying to go in there, uh, we're trying to preserve uh, hearing if we can uh, we've got enlarged vestibular aqueducts. We know that those uh, people are more prone to hearing loss from head trauma. Uh, we try to make our cochlear implant surgery as gentle as possible, but there is naturally a, a, an element of surgery like this that is somewhat traumatic. Uh, you saw his hearing tests. You know how he does in quiet. He does reasonably well. In noise, he really doesn't do very well. Uh, he's a kind of what we year, a few years back would have thought of as a very borderline candidate. Dr. Gifford has presented today the data suggesting that he should fall soundly within the candidacy criteria. But this does this change anything for anybody? Dr. Brown, does, does this change anything for you seeing the enlarged vestibular aqueducts? Um, so Liz just texted me and she said something to the effect that you better talk about the study that you did in kids because um, we actually reported on a pretty good cohort of kids that had enlarged vestibular aqueduct um, that uh, we preserved hearing on. Um, hearing preservation rates weren't as good as uh, kids that had normal hearing, but we, I think we're around 60% hearing preservation rates. Um, I do think, um, and this also goes back to the previous discussion that I become very deliberate in what electrodes I sort of tell patients they can select from. Um, and I would explicitly in a child, in a case like this where somebody has EVA, I would use a lateral wall electrode and I'd use something that is in the neighborhood of 20 to 24 millimeters in length, nothing longer. Um, because with that, um, I feel that the trauma that you're inducing into that dysmorphic cochlea is significantly less. You're not going to really get up into the apex, which um, is uh, going to be at risk of having the electrode perforate it because that's going to be malformed up in that region. And um, I think my ability to preserve hearing in that circumstance is still pretty high. So um, the only thing that would change with that would be that I would use a shorter um, flexible uh, lateral wall array. Thank you. That's a very good uh, analysis there. Dr. Rivas, you were the champion for the 32. Would you change your choice with these, uh, with these enlarged vestibular aqueducts or not? No. I mean, again, no, not at all. I think okay. that uh, I do the same as I would do uh, before. Okay. Uh, does anybody want to 
give us any comments on how they might change what they do in this individual further based on this. Would anybody else change anything? We've all, we've, all of you have had a chance to kind of sound off on what you'd like to do with this patient. I appreciate all the input with that. Uh, and I think Dr. Brown summarized, uh, you know, his views on things. Dr. Rivas uh, has uh, been more in favor of the, the 32 electrode, which is a pre-curved uh, but uh, electrode, but also has shown good hearing preservation rates in some uh, studies that he's been part of authoring. Uh, and so two sides to that, that thought. Uh, any of our other panelists have a different thought of how they might manage this or, or different considerations for it? Okay, you know what, when I saw this, I, I wasn't sure what to do. I read Dr. Brown's uh, study uh, and uh, I talked with this patient. And one of the things we didn't necessarily touch on that much, but I'm sure you guys do with your patients is, this is a guy who's progressively losing his hearing loss. So we know if we wait, it's going to get worse. And he knows that too. He's got a daughter with hearing loss. He's got enlarged vestibular aqueducts. The writing's on the wall for where this is going. And so that makes me a little bit more, uh, feel a bit better about the decision to put an implant in because we know uh, if you don't, his hearing is only going to get worse, right? Uh, and so I implanted him uh, with uh, a uh, cochlear brand electrode. And I really don't remember if it was the 22 or the 32, but he did lose the residual hearing in that right ear with the implant. Uh, but even with the loss of hearing using his implant, he performs better than he did preoperatively. There isn't much difference in quiet. And when you look at his quiet scores, remember this is someone who scored 97% uh, in quiet, uh, in the binaural state, uh, you know, at their initial testing, but in noise, uh, substantially better. And so he's happy he did it. Uh, and uh, as of yet, not interested in the other side, happy he did it for the right side. So that's kind of how uh, that case played out uh, for me. That's really all the cases I have. I do appreciate everyone for participating in the panel and being on the panel today. Uh, if anyone has any last minute comments, we can go with that. Otherwise, I thank you and I hope you have a good weekend.